It's showtime. Ah, hey, hey calling. <laughs> should, we, should we have some spy theme for today's yes. show? Yes. Uh, calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London calling Rick Beyer in Chicago. Chicago, Chicago. Chris, uh, how are you doing? Welcome, I'm doing well. Chris, welcome to History Happy Hour. Well, episode. thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I'm so happy that you came again. <laughs> yeah, just accidentally. <laughs> hey, welcome everybody to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help and assistance of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. And Chris and I, you know, we may travel the globe or sometimes not the whole globe, <laughs> uh, but we still manage to be here on Sundays to have a cocktail and talk a little bit about history. And today we'll be talking about a hotel full of spies in downtown London. Well, maybe it's not full of spies today. You never but know. Maybe it is. We don't know. Uh -huh. And Chris, I want to just, as people are joining us here, I want to give a big shout out to all of our Patreon supporters. And you know what? I did finally. I've been you threatening this out, for weeks. You? I did. You splashed out. I got everybody yeah, on the list. So not just the top shelf supporters, but all 30 of the people who are supporting us via Patreon. If your name's not on this list, why not? Why not? Um, Be one of the cool kids. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I had to move the beer bottle over in the graphic or whiskey bottle or whatever it is just to be able to fit all those names on there. But there is still room. Uh, you know, we'll we make have, room. Yeah, we can make room. We can always go to page two. So, so that's uh, that's uh, good. And please join us as a Patreon supporter if you can. Chris, who's joining us today on our show? I mean, who's who's out there in the audience? Uh, well, uh, uh, Frank Cook from uh, Attleboro, Mass. is here. Uh, Lizzie Borden, um, a, somebody you might know, a Catherine Hurst. Oh, from historic Providence, Rhode yeah. Island. Uh, Nancy Nihilus is back with us, and Doreen. So she's uh, taken a break from her stage career to join us. We're I see that uh, that uh, Xavier is checking in from. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Catalonia area and uh, Ted Moon, Skip Cornett. So we got lots of folks and I'm sure many others joining us. Thank you, all you guys. And Chris, does that give us to the position where we can actually start the open and start the show? I think so. I think we should. Oh, oh that? Yeah, right. <laughs> The bar is open. The bar is open. I've I've already you know ordered my first. So there you go. It's either a gin and tonic or a glass of water. It's good either way. I'll let you guess. You know, <laughs> deception is your business. Chris, what's on tap today on History Happy Hour? Well, this is going to be uh, a little bit of a first for us. We're kind of going on a, a History Happy Hour field trip. Uh, you know, usually we talk to uh, authors about books, but now uh, we're going to go and visit uh, one of London's uh, most historic hotels. And uh, as some of you probably know, uh, having watched the show for, for a while now, uh, the special operations executive is something that's uh, of great interest to me. And I spent a lot of my time during lockdown um, visiting special operations sites. And in the course of doing that, one place always came up, and that was St. Ermin's Hotel. Uh, one of London's grand old historic hotels. And I remember walking by there with uh, Madeline and Anna during lockdown going, hey, what a great old hotel. But really had no idea of the incredible history of it until I started doing some digging. So tonight, uh, we're very lucky. We're going to have uh, Stephen Duffy, who is the head of security for St. Ermin's Hotel. And he's going to tell us about what has been called London's House of Spies. Welcome, Steve Duffy. How are you? We, 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 we oh, need security. Welcome. How are you, Chris? Good. We Great. need security yes, on this I show. <laughs> yes, I think so. Yes. I, I, uh, I was going to point out, I thought that Chris was speaking in a foreign language there for a few moments there. Because <laughs> it was, uh, he, he was just uh, lost him on a few words. Well, well so, you know, I, I've moved. I've only been here three years, so I'm slowly getting better. It'll just take a while to, you know. He oh, didn't say okay, anything yeah, yeah, yeah. bad, I can assure you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, no. That's so. okay. <laughs> well, good evening. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. So, uh, I think one of the things that I really want to start out with, we just, uh, Rick and put it up again. We showed a picture of this just really grand hotel. Uh, so before we get into kind of the nitty gritty of why we're here, could you just briefly tell us a little bit about um, this building, when it was built? Was it always a hotel? Just some, some background stuff so people know what we're going to 
you're looking at. Sure. Okay. So what you see in, if everybody, hopefully everybody can see the, the picture you just showed there, um, that is, shows you the front entrance of the hotel, the front of the hotel. And if you imagine that the hotel itself, uh, if you were to look at it from above, is in the shape of a horseshoe. So what you can see on the left, uh, at the bottom left and right, is you see the two griffins there on the posts. Either side of those uh, are the wings of the hotel. So you have to the to uh, to the left of the picture as you look at it is the west wing, and to the right as you look at it is the east wing. And uh, that they were that's the uh, the back of the hotel where we, we see the doors at the back is the other part of the horseshoe uh, horseshoe shape. Um, the original building uh, when it was originally built, it was a built as apartments and uh, the owner had kept it as apartments. Now this is back in the days of Queen Victoria and the days of the British Empire and the, the kind of people that were staying in there. If you imagine Downton Abbey, but in an apartment block, <laughs> then you get a general idea. And uh, the 600 apartments, sorry, I was just gonna say 600 apartments, as you, as you can see on the, uh, hopefully now on the next uh, uh, little slide there. And some of them had bathrooms and some wow. didn't. That meant that you had to have go and have a quick dash along the corridor in case you needed a, uh, you know, to use the bathroom in the middle of the month. So, but the uh, <laughs> the building itself, the design and the layout of the building has, hasn't changed uh, a great deal on the outside. Just the inside, over years of uh, uh, the years, uh, the the owner of the ho uh, of the uh, the apartments, the original apartments realized that um, he could make, um, you know, as we were saying, London, a few more quid by uh, turning it into a hotel. And these, in those days, it was a hotel that was uh, more long stay. People stayed for six months or a year or even longer. Um, and then it sort of just gradually developed into what it is today. And, you know, I, I think it's worth noting uh, before we I'm not sure if this is a question or just something to put out there to respond to. Maybe you can elaborate on this. The location of the hotel yeah. is probably a reason that it becomes very important. And if you look at this uh, map, which is from a 1912 promotional brochure for uh, the hotel, I think uh, uh, St. Ermans is down there at the bottom in red. Uh, and if you're looking at this, you can probably see Buckingham Palace, uh, Westminster Abbey, Pall Mall. It is right in the heart of power London, isn't it? Oh, for sure. I mean, that's uh, was one of the, uh, I think one of the reasons why uh, the owner, because in the days when it was actually built, a lot of, with the exception of Buckingham Palace and West, uh, Westminster <laughs> Abbey uh, Buckingham Palace, a lot of the other uh, buildings and things around it were all to do with church or state. In other words, the church owned a lot of the land. Westminster Abbey owned a, a lot of land in and around that area. And still today, there's some buildings that are still sitting on land that's owned by the Westminster Abbey. Uh, but yes, the, the location, as they say, location, location, location. This mm -hmm. they put that uh, in there primarily because a lot of the when it was apartments, uh, and then again the private hotel. A lot of the people that were staying there were diplomats and uh, politicians from Parliament, uh, but diplomats from the Foreign Office who were staying in their you know used it at their London base. Right. So, so, and, and Steve, so then, of course, 20th century happens and, you know, what had been uh, kind of the golden age of empire is now uh, next next along is, is the Great War. Um, and I think it's, sure. let's kind of start there with a little bit about, um, I know that there is a specific use for the hotel during World War One, but also some, some, some of the intelligence stuff starts about that time too. So maybe... We'll kind of use that as our jumping off point to dive into that's, the history. That's right. Um, yes, that's right. We had um, MI5, which had already been in existence, uh, had already been in existence just uh, prior to the, uh, the, you know, the beginning of the First World War. They had actually uh, were a small unit at that time and were looking into um, foreign nationals, foreign, uh, you know, foreign embassies, and keeping an eye on. Uh, people like that. And in particular, they were interested in um, the German embassy, the Germans and German embassy, and in particular Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, who uh, surprisingly, um, I guess you would call him a property developer or a property <laughs> speculator. He actually was interested in buying up, I guess he was playing a, a, an earlier version of Monopoly. 
where he was going around and actually buying up properties and uh, investing in people that were building properties. And it has actually been said, although I'm trying to do some research on it at the moment, that actually Kaiser Wilhelm II invested money when the apartments, uh, St. Ermin's, when the, uh, the original apartments were being built. Oh. Although, again, that's uh, something I need to do some research on. But uh, <clears> Well, of course, he, he might be Kaiser, but also his grandmother is uh, you know, just lives just down the road in the palace. So, uh... well, it, 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 indeed, it's um, all um, it's interrelated, shall we say. They're all, um, uh, you know, it's all in Keep the family. Keep it in the family. Yes, keeping it in the family at that time. But uh, he was a very wealthy young man. And uh, then, obviously, uh, the, uh, the, the the dark clouds of war started to come uh, come this way. And uh, sadly, then, you know, as they said, the lights went out all over Europe. You know, the First World War began. And uh, so they then, just, uh, the, the, the British government then decided, right, OK, we need to blow, we, we don't have enough hospital space here for all the wounded men coming back from fighting in the Western Front. So they commandeered St. Ermin's as a hospital. It was commandeered and uh, it was then uh, taken over by the army, by army nurses uh, and doctors, uh, doctors and nurses, I should say, and also Catholic nursing nuns who were there to obviously to, to look after it and uh, look after the patients and deal with everybody there. They would have been given initial um, surgery um, on the field station, shall we say, then a bit more detailed surgery or uh, more life-saving surgery, and then brought back on a boat train uh, from France um, and then up to Victoria Station, and from there straight to St. Ermins. And St. Ermins was one of many buildings that were used in London, but ours was by far one of the largest at uh, you know the old 600 rooms. Wow. Yeah. Do we have any idea how many how many soldiers cycled through there? It must be in the thousands um, or yeah, tens in, of thousands. In the, thousand, in the in the thousands, certainly, uh, uh, as I say, in the thousands. But we know that because it was the days of the British Empire, then you had uh, soldiers there from Australia, New Zealand, Canada. South Africa, um, and also from India and uh, from Ireland, and also from different places, uh, you know, different places. Now, these were uh, either officers, senior NCOs, or uh, other, uh, and, and some other ranks as well, as the war continued, because this was uh, maintained throughout the duration of the war. So it uh, proved to be um, quite a, um, uh, a mammoth task. And they were grateful that they had the building and that space because then they could uh, build their own things uh, into the uh, the existing building. They could put up their own separate structures inside temporary structures inside the building uh, in order to house them. So wards or um, temporary uh, like mortuaries and things like that as well. You know, for uh, uh, those that uh, um, sadly didn't make it. So, so Steve, was there any other um, was there any intelligence? stuff going on or at that time or was it strictly a hospital or uh it was uh, officially it was strictly a hospital although there were um connections with uh the intelligence community with mi5 kept an eye on it because obviously they were looking at um there was uh, a possibility of uh intelligence gathering getting any information they could from um those uh wounded servicemen coming back although what it what use that information would be, I don't know, but they were gathering a lot of information and wanting to build up as much information as they could, you know, intelligence. Right, right. So in, uh, um, we can trace the, 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 the start of the connection with the Espionage Intelligence Committee uh, community to the time before World War II, but the hotel has, uh, as Chris mentioned, a very special connection with the SOE, the Special operations executive and it essentially starts with a name that uh, that we all know Winston Churchill uh, and something that happened at the hotel right that's that's right um, now this was in uh, the June of 1940 and so Winston Churchill uh, now we've had uh, at the hotel I said we the, the hotel has an association with Sir Winston Churchill that goes back to 1926 so Winston Churchill was actually um, uh, running for election, it, it maybe for the first time for the Liberal Party here in the UK, and he gave a speech at the next door, uh, next door to St. Uh, St. Ermin's is the Caxton Hall, which was the public meeting hall, the public town hall, the meeting hall, and he gave a, uh, uh, you know, a speech, a rally there, if you like, an uh, election speech, 
And so how, I'm not sure how, whether, how good or bad he did, I can't remember. But um, the thing is, is that he immediately was invited next door into the hotel to go and get drunk. And basically, <laughs> he went, to, you know, so I'm not sure how not, he did. Not, but, wait a minute, wait a minute. Not, not our Winston Churchill, please. Oh, you're course, you're suggesting not. he was a drinker of some kind? Oh, well, I, I, I heard that he, li he liked the cocktails at the bar there, though. So, so. Hmm. Yeah, well, there be, is, yeah. um, you know, we do keep his champagne just, uh, you know, <laughs> just in case anybody asks for it. But um, yeah. it's uh, uh, the, the, the thing is, is that we, we had that long association with him and he continued um, even when he became prime minister in May of 1940. He uh, became prime minister and then continued to hold court inside the hotel and would um, often be seen having lunch or meeting journalists or whoever in there or even in the bar drinking. And on this one particular case in uh, June 1940, he got a meeting together, uh, a, a rather a, a dinner together with a lot of his intelligence chiefs, his military chiefs, which is in included Earl Mountbatten and Earl Mountbatten's staff officer at the time, who was um, a very famous author, who I'll come back to in a minute. And they had the dinner and uh, during the course of this very boozy dinner um, they discussed what the, as the war wasn't going very well they discussed what they would do and so Winston Churchill came up with the idea of um, clandestine warfare he had remembered back in his days of being a prisoner in the Boer War he kept a uh, held prisoner during the, during the Boer War how um, the, the Boers had used a uh, particular clandestine method to attack the British Army. And so he uh, remembered that and then um, generated an idea amongst uh, the, those, those present. They tossed the idea around and came up with the idea of the Special Operations Executive. Right. So, the, so, oh, sorry, I was just. Uh, please, oh, no, please. I, no, no. Uh, I was just going to. What was the the uh, phrase that that he used? That the famous phrase, I guess, at that uh, at that dinner was uh, setting Europe ablaze, Blaze. right? Uh, that, that's, oh, what sure. the, that's what that's yeah, what the special I operations mean, executive was going to do. It uh, was designed, yeah. I mean, it was designed uh, basically to to get in there and disrupt um, the German and the occupied France, the forces, and also to galvanize or to coordinate the French resistance groups and the Marquis. Uh, groups that were there uh, operating there because up until that point they had all been doing their own thing and weren't talking to each other so they needed to be sort of coordinated so that they all instead of all running off like mad things um, you know doing their own thing they would have coordinated and planned attacks on you know uh, sabotage attacks on on um, particular targets uh, rather than sort of running around willy-nilly doing everything um, and that set Europe ablaze was basically like action this day, you know, it was to galvanize people to get out there and do it. Um, but the SOE itself came into formation uh, on the 22nd of July, 1940. And then was, um, you know, from that dinner, uh, which was only a few weeks before, a um, couple of weeks before, they actually had um, to get everything organized. It was like, right, Churchill says, let's go. Okay, so then they had the had to, you know, had to re, you know, actually invent or organize all this, uh, the training and everything else. So it took a while to get everything, everything done. And so the first agents didn't actually go out into occupied France to do anything until 1941, until the, uh, until the early part of 1941, because it took a while to get everybody through to be vetted and, um, you know, background checks and things like that, all those sort of things. And then to go through all the different, the four stages of training. But but so, you know and and Chris I'm just gonna make a comment and then throw to you but but it's but it's oh, don't look so sad oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh no a comment from Rick I can't it's, it's very upsetting no I was just I was just you know as you lead into your next question but it is always amazing to me how fast things have to happen in wartime right so uh, Steve just said well you know they they had they they found it in July. 1940 but the first agents don't go into Europe until 1941 but that's still like five months to found a spy agency find people and then send them in and it's just a, a great example of in this time of war how quickly things have to kind of happen and how things get thrown together and then sometimes people say well why didn't they think about this or do this and it's like because everybody is like dancing as fast as they can to make it happen 
Oh, are you done now, Rick? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for a teammate who's gonna, uh, a wingman who's gonna back me up here. I'm, uh, you know, it's, it's all right, fine, uh, fine, fine. No, no, no. But uh, one of the things that I think is so interesting is is out of this atmosphere that Rick is talking about, the speed that everything's required to, to get things up and running, and it's it's launched very quickly. It's not just SOE, though, that's operating out of the hotel, is it? There, there are other spooks and spies and whatnot already kind of hanging out there. So who else is, is sharing this space with the SOE, and how are they getting along? Now, yeah, now that's um, it's quite interesting because you had um, at the um, initially in the, during World War Two, a lot of the uh, the government buildings would, were were uh, either damaged, you know, bombed or damaged or uh, misplaced, or they removed everybody out. And in this particular case, uh, when the uh, SOE was formed and they set up shop, shall we say, in, in uh, July of 1940. The uh, immediately the the first place they moved into was uh, St. Ermin's Hotel. They moved in there to, into a suite of offices, and immediately in the corridor opposite them was MI6. <laughs> now, MI6 <laughs> Which they're very competitive with, right? Yes, it, it's it's because they were very um, very much saying, "Who the hell are these young upstarts? Who are all these idiots? You know, we just, what's this SOE? What's all that about? You know, and." The biggest problem was was, was with communication um, because the SOE didn't ha as yet have its own communications network. In other words, it's on wireless or it's radio uh, traffic for radio signals to get outside of London to when they sent agents uh, into Australia France. So they had to rely on their neighbours in MI6, and often begrudgingly MI6 would let them use their radio network. But the thing is, if there was messages coming back from France back to London, MI6 would sit on it for a couple of days and then, um, you know, then only when they got round to it and felt like it and hadn't written, you know, their, their bets on the back of it or uh, poured, uh, used it as a tea strainer, they would uh, give it back to, um, you know, pass it across the corridor because they weren't, um, they initially didn't get on, but then grudgingly, as I said, um, MI6 then began to realise, okay, Churchill wants this, we better get on with this and, and let them, you know, uh, start to play nice. So, and, and all this is all this is going on, Steve. Now, you can tell me if this story is correct or not. But I'd read that, um, you know, even though there are six floors, if you were a guest at the hotel, the elevator only went up to floor four, and then you just something else was happening above you. Is that true? Or are, are the guests still at the hotel when all this is? Yeah, this is, yes, the hotel is still active, yeah, I mean, this is during wartime, so the hotel is still open for business, it never closed during the Second World War, uh, uh, so it was open for business, and it was still there, um, and even during the height of air raid warnings and things like that, everybody <coughs> was downstairs into the basement, uh, similar to where I am now, uh, into the basement, and uh, they would, um, uh, you know, the, the, the lower parts of the hotel were used as air raid shelters, but Yes, the, the, it's um, hiding in plain sight is what I'm trying to say. That's what they were doing is the secret organizations were there. But to be honest, you would never know because it was just their business as usual. Well, then we would probably uh, uh, recognize the names of some of the people who were there. And, and you, you, you did actually already make mention of somebody who, uh, who you refused to name, you, uh, uh, Steve, earlier, a famous author who was ah, yes. Matt Batten's assistant. I think we can yes. guess who that is, but uh, he's involved in some of the wartime goings on at, uh, at St. Ermans. Who's that? Yes, no, that's the clandestine. Um, now, you had... Uh, Earl Mountbatten was in charge of combined operations, and his staff officer, the uh, or as you would say today, his personal assistant, if you like, was Ian Fleming, Lieutenant Ian Fleming, and he was uh, in works. They uh, worked with naval intelligence, and uh, which was basically a the intelligence wing of the Navy, Royal Navy, and they worked closely with MI6, MI5, but mostly MI6 because it's overseas. And uh, he uh, was there basically to, uh, to um, uh, oversee, you know, to, to, to be the sort of the liaison, if you like, between anything the SOE did and OMAP Batten as well, because he would have had a, um, a say in it. It would have been discussed at committee level and he would have had a say in it, particularly for the operations that they were going to do. And um, having then visited 
um, in Fleming that visited the, the various training sections that they did, particularly the, um, uh, the, the live training in Scotland, the live firing training, the combat school in Scotland. Uh, he went up there and was that was um, you know gave them very favourable reports and uh, reported back to uh, Earl Mountbatten, Earl Mountbatten and Churchill to sort of say yes, it's all going very very well. So, Steve, who are some of the others? I mean, I know I, there's the names that I've come across as I've been read, reading about the hotel. Who are some of the other famous or notable people that we you know would have been passing through the hotel that somebody might have bumped into? I, I mean, I know uh, Noel Coward was there. Who some? Who are some of the others? Oh, sure, of course. I mean, it, you would have had uh, Noel Coward, Douglas Fairbanks, uh, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Uh, or Douglas Fairbanks, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. One or the other. I always get that one mixed up. Douglas Fairbanks uh, Jr., who's had... involved in the yeah, he's connect. He's close with Mount Batten and involved with the U.S. Navy. Yep. Sorry. Go ahead. And um, you then have um, the other uh, person. It's the other person who is more famous and, and, and now, sadly, he's no longer with us. Was a, a, a famous actor called uh, Christopher Lee. Yeah. And he's a British actor called Christopher Lee, yeah. and he was um, very famous over here for um, you know it's, he uh, was a famous actor. But during the Second World War, he was a, um, an agent with SOE. He was an SOE, uh, an SOE agent, so that's probably something that wasn't very well known. Um, and uh, although it is, you know, a matter of public record, he is he did serve there and having done my research. But uh, just going back a little bit further um, was uh, the another famous face that we had quite a lot of. Um, I, I understand was uh, Rudyard Kipling, hmm. the uh, famous British author called Rudyard Kipling. And he would uh, he would often um, be sat. He would use St Ermines as his London base. He had a home in the in the country, and out in the country. And whenever he travelled up into London, and he was staying for periods of time to do his business or whatever he was doing, he would stay at St Ermines. So I want to remind everybody that we're talking to Steve Duffy, and Steve is the uh, the security manager at St. Ermans Hotel in London, and he joins us from the hotel, from the historic site we're talking about. And obviously, as you have figured out, if you're watching, he's also uh, a bit of a sleuth, a bit of a historian, uh, interested in all this fascinating stuff. And Chris, we did promise a little bit of a tour, so oh. I, I think we should should deliver on that. And I'm not sure how much there is to say about it, but I do want to start with the lobby because it's a, it is such a grand looking lobby of this hotel. But but, but before we get it right, as your as that picture's up, there's something I want to read. Yeah, go right. ahead. So this is from Malcolm Muggeridge, who is uh, very famous in British intelligence circles, um, and he <clears> said <throat> of St. Ermans that it was dim and quiet suggestive of conferences to promote world governments, family planning, or the practice of eurythmics. <laughs> so, I'm not sure what all of that means. <laughs> but it sounds wonderful, doesn't it? So, so but, but the reason I want to say that, so as we're looking at these pictures, is this similar to what Malcolm Muggeridge would have seen, or is it right? This is this is this has been restored, right, uh, Steve? Because it it, uh, uh, it is this what it would have looked like in its heyday as well? Yes, absolutely. What you can see there, all the uh, the fixtures, the fittings, and everything else, the balconies. Uh, you can see the, the staircase in the center of the photograph there, and then uh, coming off that staircase on the uh, the uh, the upper floor there, you see the lobby balcony. All of that is original features. All of that wow. is, was there with the days of the apartment. And the only thing that's happened is we did a refurbishment between November 2010 and April 2011 and brought it back to the uh, Colgate White, if you like, that it is now. Wow. And, and Chris, do you, do you want to ask him about the, the, the secret door? Oh, yes. Well, yes. So there's a bunch of places uh, in the hotel um, that were really great. Uh, Steve was really kind to give me a tour there. Um, and there's uh, rumors of um, the hotel being an important junction spot for some underground travel. Uh, and Steve showed me the entrance uh, to oh, it's an amazing underground tunnel system, which you walk into the hotel and you see this and you walk right by it. But uh, underground, it can lead you to some amazing places. Steve, could you talk a little bit about um, what we're looking at and what it leads to and how it, it fits into this whole story. And, and don't say anything that would require you to kill us at the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
No, it's um, it's just that what you can see. Could you put the uh, the uh, the first picture up again? Uh, the lobby picture up again? Just uh, uh, yeah, just to show you that's the um, you can see the staircase in the center of the uh, of the picture. And if you can go back to the uh, that uh, second picture again with the door, please there you go. And uh, now that's the sense that's the, the the stairs, the very same stairs you saw in the lobby there, and it's the white door that you can see in the middle of the stairs there that leads through inside there and actually behind that door would have led to uh, on either side uh, some spiral staircases that would have taken you down um, now that's um, a section there is on the lobby is on the ground floor or first floor as you as uh, the americans love to call it um, but that's uh, the um uh, on the in our uh, sort of lobby area and then below that there are three levels of basement below that one of which i'm in now um, but uh, the um, the it's going downstairs. It would have actually taken you into below those lower levels. It would have taken you to another door where it would have taken you down into a tunnel, into a tunnel which then uh, leads in one direction goes towards Buckingham Palace, and then in the opposite direction will go towards Parliament Square. Parliament. Okay. Uh, okay, okay but, 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 so wait a minute. So there are tunnels underneath Saint. Urs. There are secret tunnels. Yes. that lead to Buckingham Palace and Parliament yep. under it's your so hotel. Cool. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. It's so cool. Yes. Now, the um, tunnels have been there. The, the why? tunnels have been there for many, many years. And um, the, uh, they were actually used uh, primarily as... Uh, um, air, I mentioned before about the air raid shelters during the Blitz in 1940, the, the bombing in London. When the air raid sirens sounded, they needed... The people, the guests of the hotel would go downstairs into... The, the basement and use those the deep, as deep shelters. But they still had, um, even um, Sir Winston Churchill would actually pop in and out. He wouldn't bother using the car. He could walk from his tunnel. He could walk through the tunnel and come upstairs into, into, the, into the lobby and just appear and disappear at will. Is there, Chris, is there a way we can do a, a tour that goes well, from I the think... cabinet war rooms to the St. Urban's and just does it underground? Well, that's what I want to do. I want to start at the cabinet war, at war rooms and try to get to St. Urban's. Do, do, do we drink. know if the if the tunnels are still there, uh, Steve? Yes. Um, now, there's a, there is either tunnels. This is the secret part. Yeah. Just, just, just don't tell anybody. Our audience just promises just not to there. tell anyone. <laughs> okay. Uh, just between us now there are uh, obviously in the, the tunnels there are obviously sections of the tunnel that are still there but obviously during that after the second world war 1945 46 the what is now the london underground the subway that runs underneath there expanded the district line expanded and so some of those tunnels were taken up so if i do take you down there and i open the wrong door then <laughs> we'll um, obviously possibly have a tube train go past yeah. yeah, so we have to be very, very careful because we wouldn't well, want to lose you. Well, the tube's always on strike, so we'll just pick one of the days that we're on strike, and then we'll yeah, just... of course, absolutely, that's a good idea. Yes. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. So one of the stories you told me though when you took me there um, uh, was about how some uh, somewhat well-known people use the tunnels to celebrate, uh, well, well, to avoid uh, some of the the bombing. Could you kind of explain oh, yes. that? Um, the, uh, now, as I mentioned before, the, the tunnel actually runs from uh, Buckingham Palace through and underneath to the hotel and then would continue on and go towards Parliament if they wanted to or otherwise come up. Now, during the, the bombing of the, uh, the Blitz of 1940, Buckingham Palace was uh, heavily bombed and uh, received a few direct hits. The King and Queen at the time um, were advised to uh, evacuate and go and leave and uh, go into go to Windsor, get out of London and go to Windsor. They refused because for a simple reason, that, uh, as Queen Mother put it, she couldn't, they couldn't actually leave, the Majesties couldn't leave because they couldn't leave, look the Londoners in the eye again. Because at that time, the east end of London, the box was getting heavily bombed. And so people couldn't, you know, they, they wanted to show that we're doing the same thing. We're still all here, to, um, you know, we're all in this together. So what they decided to do is to evacuate the young princesses, uh, Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret. Uh, they were their daughters, and they wanted to evacuate them to uh, Windsor. So what they did is they walked them along the tunnel, up into um, up the staircase, up into St. Barman's, into the lobby, and the car uh, was waiting for them outside to take them off to Windsor. 
Um, obviously, Princess Elizabeth is now our current queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth II. Wow. Wow. There's also another thing I want to uh, 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 get to on our on our little tour here uh, is the um, you have a, a display, a very interesting display at the hotel of some cool espionage related stuff. So give us give us a sense of what's going on here in this uh, in this great cabinet here. Okay. Um, well, what you see in the cabinet there is uh, the writing on the wall, the logo uh, that you see on the left of the glass there, show that it's actually uh, part of the uh, London Clandestine Warfare Collection, and that is uh, a an organisation, you know, a group that we're working with uh, to, in order to um, preserve the history particularly as we, as we, St. Ermines, are the birthplace of the Special Operations Executive. A lot of the items that are in the, the, uh, the, the cabinet there are actually to do with the SOE. And um, it also enables the um, items then to be, to, 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 the, to have their, their story. I mean, as you can see in the, um, the bottom of, uh, you probably can't see it quite clearly, so in the middle sort of shelf, you can probably uh, possibly see in the middle shelf some uh, headsets for Morse code. And in the uh, the bottom on the floor, there is, you probably can't see it very well, it's probably not a good picture, but on the um, on the floor is actually a Morse code radio, which is like a biscuit tin radio, which is uh, basically designed to be broken up into small pieces. Uh, it comes apart and just designed that way. It's come apart with small pieces. You put in the tin and then the tin to be buried in the barn in occupied France so that it, it, it wouldn't be found. Um, the other on the uh, other parts there, you will see the uniform there uh, at the back. That is a first aid nursing yeomanry. The uniform there is from a first aid nursing yeomanry. And that uniform there is uh, worn during a lot of the female agents when they were going through training needed a cover story. So a lot of uh, awkward questions would be asked. So uh, the, the cover story, the cover unit, were given the rank of ensign in the first aid nursing yeomanry. Uh, the first aid nursing yeomanry is an all-female unit. It's uh, no men at all. It's an all-female unit. And that uniform there is belonged to one particular agent, um, who I can tell you the story if you'd like to hear it. Is, Absolutely. Uh, what, uh, one particular agent. Now, this um, particular agent um, was uh, born in London and uh, she left school at 14. She uh, went, uh, in, she left school at 14. She went to work in a, um, a local department store in Brixton in South London uh, called Morley's. She then met, married, uh, met, fell in love and married a, a slightly older man. Uh, she was around about 17 at this time, around about 17 at this time. She married, uh, uh, met, uh, fell in love and married an older man by the name of Etienne Zabo, uh, who was an officer in the French Foreign Legion. They had um, a daughter, and then uh, later on, uh, he was called back to uh, go and fight in North Africa. Sadly, uh, by the time their daughter was two years old, um, he was killed in fighting in North Africa. Um, in order to, uh, she was, um, you know, enraged by this that he, he should be uh, killed and uh, you know uh, t taken away from her so she volunteered for the um, SOE and uh, she was checked out and everything else and because she has a because she had a French mother and an English father she spoke French with a non without an accent and so she was sent for training uh, she was sent for training and then sent on her first mission which was uh, she parachuted into occupied uh, into occupied France it was very, very successful. Um, she was then uh, brought back for rest and recuperation, uh, but then things changed and her bosses said to her, right, we need you to go back straight away into, a, into another area um, and to do it. You don't have to do this. We won't feel you know, anything against you if you say no. But she said, no, no, I'm gonna go and do it. So she went in to do it. And this was just before D-Day in uh, 1944. And she went into, um, this area to uh, to to, uh, to meet up with uh, uh, the resistance group, and unfortunately they uh, were uh, they ran into a German uh, patrol or were uh, were you know uh, were uncovered somehow betrayed, and um, the uh, the German patrol there was a firefight. Uh, some of her she 
decided, right, I'm going to stay there. And she had a stem gun and she had a, a, a large amount of ammunition with the stem gun. And she managed to hold on this German patrol, um, which was about uh, 15 men. She managed to hold them off for about four hours. Um, eventually, she ran out of ammunition. Um, they then stormed the house and then she was arrested, um, taken for interrogation and uh, then um, treated brutally, you know, brutally interrogated and beaten and starved. Uh, and unfortunately, she um, was then uh, transferred to a number of prisons and uh, more interrogations and a number of prisons. And then she ended up at uh, Ravensbrück concentration camp um, where um, sadly she was uh, executed at the age of 23. Yeah. Uh, her name was uh, Violet Zarbo. Uh, Violet Zarbo, and for that she won the uh, the George Cross, the GC, <coughs> or the GC, amongst other um, medals as well, which was uh, presented uh, by the King, uh, King George VI, uh, our current Queen's um, uh, father, uh, to her daughter Tanya, who was uh, you know old enough then to go and uh, get the medal from on behalf of her, her mother. So you know, you, these are sort, the sorts of things you don't usually see in a hotel lobby. I gotta say, yeah. <laughs> the collection is pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 I I, I um, you know, uh, and we've talked about uh, Violet Zabo before on History Happy Hour. So if you, you know, we did a, a, a whole show about uh, uh, women members of the SOE and uh, Kate Vigor's book uh, Mission France, which was which was really eye-opening. One of the other things in that cabinet that I got uh, kind of a kick out of, there were two items, a, a hairbrush and a pistol. Uh, and I, we have photos of the hairbrush is a dagger. It's a, it's a, got a dagger hidden in the handle there. And then uh, what's, did, can you, what's the story with this pistol that's also in the cabinet? Ah, the, the F-46. Yeah, now this is, uh, there's actually a couple of, Pistols actually in there that I've, um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this one because not many people notice this one. This this was made uh, mass produced by a toy company during the war, and um, a lot of the the toy companies were asked to get involved in the producing um, weapons and equipment. Uh, the British government and also you know uh, had asked them to get involved in doing things, and so it's basically a very it's a tin. Um, it's in toy. It's 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 a toy gun, but that fires the, that fires live rounds. Um, it just takes uh, t uh, I think it's five rounds in there. It's in the magazine. It takes five rounds, and it's designed to be fired. And as soon as you run out, throw it away. It's designed to just to be thrown away. Use that that, that once. You know, there's no point reloading it because the, the, what they noticed is if you do reload it and you start firing again, it gets very hot. And then the thing is, it just starts to malfunction. So it's just designed for a quick shot, and then that's it. So it's a, a cheap and nasty, essentially. Yeah, basically, yeah. That's, that was it. It was just uh, they were part of the uh, the equipment that was uh, airdropped in, uh, you know, amongst all the other things. The uh, they'd asked for the supplies, and they had um, a lot of other things. There's the well rod. Um, I'm not sure if you can you have a, um, could see it, but there was a a, a particular. Uh, silence killing pistol that was um, basically a long tube um, that was called a well rod. It's actually sitting up on the top um, on the top corner there, on the top right hand corner of the picture. Um, unfortunately, it's on the shelf there, but uh, it's uh, it's called a well rod, and it was designed um, uh, in Welling Garden City. Uh, w, uh, so that's where the well comes from, W E L, and rod because it's basically there. It takes seven rounds and fires, and again. It's designed to go up, and um, it's it's the um, it's the early version of the, uh, the compressor that you see on um, you see on the movies today when the the uh, the guy is actually screwing a silencer onto the front of a weapon. Well, that's the sort of basics, the the, the idea of it. Hmm. So there's some wonderful things in that display case. I mean, things I I'd never seen anywhere else. It's, uh, it's well, it's, it's, there's thousands of items in the collection, and we what we do is we rotate them around quite a lot um, in order to uh, to keep the uh, the history alive, and particularly if they've got a unique story. I mean, there's there's a couple of pieces in there which um, are new pieces we're we're bringing in, which is uh, one is a, uh, a fob watch, um, you know, a, a watch that's worn on a waistcoat. Um, a, a sort of a typically British thing that you take out to actually read. Well, this was used 
um, it actually doubles as a camera and it has a small amount of film in there and doubles as a camera to enable you to uh, be able to take pictures, um, you know, for uh, at, at close quarters. Not hundred, you know, not very very good pictures, but hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, you know, good enough to be able to see what you're looking at. Yeah. Rick does this once every show. We had some we had some complaints about the audio. I was trying different settings right. to see if we could improve things a little bit. Um, but uh, I was going to say the spy connection of the hotel does not end with uh, World War II, does it? Because there's some goings on there in the 1950s, uh, and especially regarding the very famous, uh, you know, Kim Philby and Guy Burgess. They they also have their connections with this hotel, and they're. They're spying for Russia, which they did in the in the 1950s and up to the early 60s. Also, some of that is happening at uh, St. Ermans, isn't it? Oh, for sure. Uh, yes. Um, now, the interesting thing is, is that uh, Mrs. Uh, Mr. Uh, Burgess, Philby, McLean, Blunt and Cancross, the, the, the Cambridge Five, uh, they were all uh, they were all agents in SOE and they all started off, particularly Philby, um, Philby and uh, particularly Philby and McLean and Burgess, they were all uh, um, started off as agents. They were, uh, uh, you know, did serve their country in the SOE and then obviously moved across to MI6 to work there for MI6. And um, yes, it's uh, something that what they did is they met their handlers, um, their Russian handlers um, in the bar of St. Hermans because, again, we, as we mentioned before, hiding in plain sight. They would sit in the bar and they would obviously, um, uh, you know, have their drinks and be talking openly about what they were doing because, again, nobody expects people to be sitting in there talking about, you know, state secrets because, you know, they could have been talking about the weather or typical British thing of talking about the weather or they could have been um, talking about last week's football. I, I yeah I don't I, I I try to minimize my spy discussions in the bar uh, <laughs> as much as I as much as I can. Um, Chris, can I can I take a yeah, question from our our, our audience here? Uh, we we had a couple of them, uh, and one regarded the items we were just looking at in the display case. And Nancy wanted to know: uh, Were these things just left behind or found around the hotel? What's the story behind that that collection in the display case? Now, the um, collection is to do with um, a group called the London Clandestine Warfare Collection, and they have come together. They've recently been formed. Um, they've come together. They've had the collection of, of the items for some time, and what we did is we put it together. We brought the two parts together because we are the birthplace of, of the SOE, and they, they knew about us. So they came to us to sort of say, OK, we want to put a display cabinet there. Um, can you help us with a display cabinet? So it, in other words, it, it's, it enables us to bring to life the history of our, our history within the hotel, but also keeps the history of those items alive by telling the stories about them. So, Steve, what, um, what did so SOE gets founded? becomes a very large operation. It gets its facilities expand. Uh, they pretty much occupy all of Baker Street, which is why they're called the Baker Street Irregulars. Um, but obviously, they continue to use uh, St. Ermans. What do they use it for? So, you know, what would you encounter at the hotel uh, if you were becoming involved in the SOE? Why would you go to St. Ermans? You would have gone to St. Ermans as uh, initially as the place of operations because that is where, uh, when the when it was first set up in the July of 1940, that is where the, the first base was, uh, you know, the first place, and that's where the operations room, if you like, uh, was based. That then gradually moved, um, expand, you know, got bigger and bigger, and so it outgrew the rooms that it was in, and particularly. You know, they wanted to move away from MI6 because, you know, they were bad neighbors. Um, yeah, they didn't get on. Um, and so they, they obviously then moved to, uh, as you say, to Baker Street, but they also had offices at Broadway House. They had a various different places where Baker Street was their main place. Um, but St. Hermes was continued to be used because in the event that they wanted to meet people, 
um, because they couldn't take them to Broadway House or they couldn't take them to Baker Street. So they would actually use that as a central location. And particularly if agents were coming back into London to be debriefed, you know, so they could rest and recover. They had the rooms there so that, you know, they, they could sleep and recover. And then um, if there was any sort of admin uh, or anything like that, anything sort of quite, um, you know, the very friendly sort of things to be done. You know, Chris likes to harass me for uh, being muted, but Chris, I want to let you know that you're muted. Uh, so you might want to unmute yourself if you if you want to continue with the conversation. I mean, you know, you know, it's okay if you're if you're not interested. But but well, Chris is working on that, and I will pay dearly for those remarks. Um, I, I want to ask uh, sort of two questions um, uh, about today. One is kind of what the reaction is that you get from guests uh, when they hear about this history. And the other thing is, what's going on today? Come on, give us the dope. What's, the, what's happening with spies at the Claxton Bar or the lobby of St. Irvin's here in 2022? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you may think that I couldn't possibly comment. Um, yes. Oh, but uh, I think you can. <laughs> oh, it's, it, it, uh, given its location. Well, you can answer the front first part of the question. You talk to a lot of guests at the hotel. What's their yeah. reaction hearing about the stories there? Oh, they they uh, they are thrilled. Um, they're thrilled. I mean, I know that uh, I do a lot of the the guided tours. Uh, around the hotel, I take uh, guests and show them around and tell them the stories, and then they're quite thrilled by that and quite surprised um, because there is also uh, the uh, the other thing about the SOE. Uh, the interesting thing I know we're probably we were going to come on to talk about it, but there's the other thing about the SOE is that uh, I know that Eisenhower and uh, had looked at it, uh, the SOE, and looked at the operation and looked at what they were doing and then um, wanted his own version of that. And so then um, they took the instructors, some of the instructors from the SOE training schools, took them across to America to actually set up uh, training for a thing called the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which, um, I, as I understand it, and hopefully I've got this right, Eastnet was the forerunner of the, what you the have CAA. Yeah. Yeah. So Absolutely. So the, so we now get people, um, you know, people from the CIA at uh, um, Langley and other places um, come across um, researchers and people like that who actually come across and they want, they were interested because they're going sort of backwards and looking at the history and, and doing papers or, uh, you know, it, uh, are just interested in it and they come and talk to me about it and um, I'm able to then to show them the various uh, things that, as we've discussed tonight. Well, I think one of the things that's amazing um, is, is from St. Ermans, you can do a walking tour of just about the whole history of British intelligence. I oh, mean, sure. yes. Just the yes. hotel and all the buildings around it occupied by various British intelligence agencies. It, it's very centrally located. So you can see how it became uh, the focal point for a lot of this stuff. Um, what are the, Steve, are there any things as, you, as you've been researching the hotel uh, that, you know, have kind of surprised you? I mean, obviously, you probably know that building better than most people. Um, yes, uh, one of the things that uh, does uh, does surprise me, I, I think, is or surprises that some of the people I, t I tell them is, is that we have ghosts. The, the, we, I know it's probably not what we were talking about tonight, but we do have ghosts within the um, uh, the building, and whether you um, believe in them or not, it's a case of um, we have uh, three ghosts that we know about. Um, three, uh, two of them, uh, two of the three are actually uh, Canadian officers who sadly um, were in the First World War, who were, uh, um, you know, recovering from injuries in their uh, at, at, when it was, at Owens was a hospital. They uh, sadly, um, uh, they uh, sadly didn't make it. They they passed away, and their ghosts can be seen in and around the hotel in around the sort of October November time. Uh, yeah, they're, trying to find, they're trying to find a decent hockey game. I, I noticed that Chris wasn't interested in the ghosts at all until he <laughs> discovered they were Canadian ghosts, and they're suddenly like he Canadian. perked right up. Yeah, 
I believe it, the regiment was the Princess Alexandra's uh, Regiment of Canada. Now, I've probably got that wrong and I'm probably going to get shot, no, shot for that, but um, the, uh, I, I will get that right eventually, but hopefully that's the right thing, is that that's the right regiment. I did Canadians have a good, are very nice. They'll give you a, a pass. Well, I'll see if you let me hang out at the hotel bar for a while. I'll do a you know Canadians at the St. Irmans tour for you. We'll we'll get that all sure. sorted. Out. And I, <laughs> I, I think oh go ahead, Steve. I, I was just going to say just as we mentioned in the Canadians, did you know that there was obviously a Canadian section for the SOE? I did. But, but but our guests don't. So why don't you tell them? No, the Canadian section. It's just only something that I, I you, you, something that I didn't I didn't know about is that the um, I knew that the SOE was there, and I knew that the SOE then it became the the, the Americans had it. But then I've just only just discovered that there is obviously the Canadian side, the, the Canadian side for it, which I'm researching now at the moment. And um, somebody's actually going to be sending me. Um, a copy of their uh, some of their work that they've done previously on that research work that oh, they've nice. done to tell me a bit more about it. Um, and it was a particular Canadian unit that was done. Um, should the uh, the war had gone on a lot longer than it did, then um, obviously they were thinking of um, you know different directions the war could have gone in. So they needed to start training up as many agents as possible. And and Canada was uh, was a, a good source of people. See, Rick, point of the spear. Point of the sphere. Uh, awesome. It always. It's always about Canada. Steve Duffy, so we want to thank you for joining us today. I want to, somebody asked a question. We want to say, yes, St. Ermans is a four star active hotel in London. You can book your room, you know, tonight or tomorrow night or, or any night that they have rooms available. And Steve, for people who are there in London and they think, I want to come by, I want to get one of these tours, I want to find out what's going on at that hotel, what can they do? They can uh, uh, get in touch with the hotel website, uh, which is www.sterminshotel.com. .co.uk. That's all lowercase. Uh, St. Norman's Hotel. Co. UK. Or uh, they can uh, get in touch uh, with with me. Um, uh, I can give out my email address, which is um, the S uh, Duffy at St. Norman's Hotel. Co. UK. They can email me and uh, to ask me for uh, one of the tours, and I'm very happy to do it. Oh, they're and, really cool, guys. And they have tours, tours with tea and tours with beer. So you get your, you get yes. your choice there. That's the uh, the tours. The tours with the tea is in the afternoon, and the tours with the beers is in the evening for uh, the, the more discerning palate. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Duffy, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome. It's been a great very pleasure. Welcome. I hope to get to to meet you uh, the next time or one of the future times I'm in London and uh, when I'm hanging out at St. Ermans Hotel. Uh, it's totally looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. You're very welcome. Take care. And uh, uh, I, I, uh, you know, we totally should have hit St. Ermans up to sponsor this show, right? Oh, well, people Steve, probably think you're listening. People probably think we did, but uh, uh, but, but we didn't. This was this was all just a, a great piece of uh, intelligence and SOE history. Uh, uh, all kind of in one cool building, so that was pretty nifty and neat. I liked yeah, it. It was, and it's a, it's a, it's a really it's a one of those places you walk into, and you absolutely feel the sense of history there. It's, so uh, I, I think I so can I get Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours to book me in the St. Ermans the next time I'm in London. Well, Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours bought me a drink there a couple times. So, uh, <laughs> do, do, do they know that they did that? They do now. <laughs> oh, well, listen, everybody, uh, if you liked what you saw today, and why wouldn't you, right? Uh, could you please like us? We're so desperate to be liked. Like us on Facebook or subscribe if you're on YouTube. It just takes a second. It really helps, and uh, and we do really appreciate it. And uh, and we're, not, we're, we're here again next week. What a shock and surprise. Chris... Uh -huh. Uh, we're, can we, we're, we're going back to World War One next yes. week. Back to the trenches. Uh, great new book about the Meuse Argonne. Um, and again, one of the things I really like about it is it talks about the whole history of the war in uh, that part of the Western Front, and not just you know September 1918. So a good overview of uh, the Great War in the Argonne Forest by somebody who lives there. So. Yeah, he's got a house there, and he does battlefield tours, and you know how much that appeals to us as yes. somebody with the with the first hand on the ground, boots on the ground knowledge, and uh, so we're really looking forward 
to talking to Richard Mary, and I agree. I mean, I really only know mostly about the uh, American involvement late in the war, and um, and so I'm ready to dig in and discover a lot more. Hopefully, that I don't know, but still, maybe we can talk about you know Sergeant York or the Lost Battalion oh, yeah. or something there. Um, everybody, thank you so much for joining so us much, today. We really appreciate it. Stay safe, everyone. Oh my God, where's the clothes? Oh, okay. Oh, oh. Yeah.